Often in the past, and sometimes in the present, these two theories or political philosophies or traditions, that is liberalism and Marxism, were defined or characterized <coughs> in such a way that there was and could be very little genuine dialogue between them. And this virtually ensured that the vast majority of their interactions could be described as clashes of ideologies. <clears throat> First, while the term liberalism in many parts of the world, including um, Eastern Europe, I found out, um, while the term liberalism in many parts of the world connotes or means only a political philosophy or ideology like classical liberalism, supposedly, for example, John Locke's theory, free market liberalism, for example, Friedrich von Hayek or Milton Friedman, right or right-wing libertarianism, for example, the early Robert Nozick, um, I say the early Robert Nozick because uh, he was famous for his so-called minimal state libertarianism in his early works, but what very few people know or what right libertarians usually don't admit is that later in his development of his ideas, Robert Nozick completely uh, rejected his earlier right libertarianism in favor of progressive liberalism. <laughs> Or, speaking of uh, you know liberalism, how it's interpreted, it could be neoliberalism, right? Also referred to as the Washington Consensus, as embodied in the World Trade Organization and the strategy of corporate globalization from above, which has, since the 1980s, demanded ever-increasing free global markets. But in much of the West, especially English language countries, the term liberal doesn't usually refer to these views, but rather to what can also be referred to as social liberalism, or progressive liberalism, or egalitarian liberalism, or what is the same, liberal egalitarianism. This view, I'm saying those are just different words for the same view. This view demands both liberty, civil liberties and democracy, political democracy, but also material equality, not strict equality, you know, of income and wealth, but equality of income and wealth within certain allowable limits. For example, perhaps something like a 10 to 1 ratio or spread between the richest and poorest members of society. As we all know, in most societies on the planet today, the, the spread of wealth is way, 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 way more than 10 to 1, right? So the argument of John Rawls and similar liberal theorists is not that we should have exact equality, which is probably impossible and not a good thing. I mean, equality of income and wealth, but not something like the vast differences of wealth and, and income that characterize most countries in the world, especially, for example, the United States, but rather a more moderate uh, level of inequality of income and wealth. Okay. <laughs> in order to accomplish these goals of liberty and material equality, progressive liberalism allows as much government intervention in the economy and as much government provision of public goods such as healthcare and education, as needed to ensure that these goals of liberty and equality are met. This is the kind of liberalism that is currently the dominant political philosophy in the West, or at least in English-speaking countries, and actually also Scandinavia and the Netherlands. The most important philosopher in this tradition, as Lubos and Mikhail, I believe, were pointing out, is John Rawls. Uh, who passed away in 2002. But many other important philosophers are also progressive liberals in the above sense, including Ronald, such philosophers as Ronald Dworkin, who actually just passed away a few months ago, Amatya Sen, the great economist and philosopher originally from India, Martha Nussbaum, and Thomas Scanlon, one of uh, John Rawls's colleagues at Harvard. On the other hand, 
What complicates this situation is that many philosophers who accept basically the same set of moral values or same theories of social justice as these progressive liberals like Rawls or what I should also refer to as liberal egalitarians do not agree with their conclusion that these values or theories of social justice and human rights demand some sort of reformed egalitarian welfare state capitalism at this point in history. The, these philosophers and other theorists I have in mind, different kinds of socialist uh, philosophers, <coughs> These kind of uh, other theorists I have in mind conclude, rather, that the correct set of moral values and principles of social justice demand the creation of democratic and usually, they say, market socialist societies. This school of thought or political philosophy can be called, and has been called, liberal-socialist egalitarianism as opposed to just liberal egalitarians. So I'm saying these people are liberal-socialist egalitarians. This school includes <coughs> such prominent philosophers and theorists as Kai Nielsen, G.A. Cohen, who also passed away a few years ago, Jan Elster, who's a sociologist from Norway, John Romer, who's an economist and philosopher from the United States, Eric Olin Wright, who's a very famous uh, sociologist from the United States. David Schweiker, who's an economist and philosopher, who's been here in Slovakia in the last few years, I believe. And myself, just to name a few. <coughs> the only essential difference between liberal egalitarians and liberal-socialist egalitarians concerns the empirical social scientific theories and analyses they accept. While liberal egalitarians accept empirical views that lead them to endorse democratic, more egalitarian welfare state capitalism as best meeting the correct set of moral values and or principles of social justice and human rights, liberal socialist egalitarians accept empirical views that lead them to endorse democratic and as I said usually market forms of egalitarian socialism. <coughs> Moreover, it is also accurate to describe liberal socialist egalitarians as Marxists, or at least as neo-Marxists, although they are Marxist or neo-Marxists of, I would say, a particularly sophisticated sort, who also share certain values with the liberal egalitarians or progressive liberals. In fact, what I claim, when I claim, that progressive liberals and various kinds of socialists and Marxists have basically compatible views in political philosophy, what I'm saying can be summarized by specifying the following six or perhaps seven political positions um, that can be analyzed as having similar enough views, both moral views and empirical views, that they could perhaps, at this point in history, reach a strategic consensus, what I call a strategic consensus, on trying to create democratic market socialist societies and, over the long run, a global federation of such societies. <coughs> the six traditions of which I speak are, first, progressive liberal egalitarianism, which can also be just called progressive liberalism, liberal egalitarian progressivism, and so on, as represented, for example, by the early John Stuart Mill, John Maynard Keynes, the famous liberal economist of the early 20th century, and more recently, John Rawls. Secondly, these are the traditions that I, I think can are, are, are the noble traditions and hopefully can reach a strategic consensus. Our, the second one is social democracy. For example, Edward Bernstein, Leon Blum, Salvador Allende, and Olaf Palm, as well as 
I'm putting in the same category, such reformist communists as Alexander Dubček and Mikhail Gorbachev, and such Euro communists as Santiago Carrillo. Third category, noble political traditions, are democratic market socialists, or those in favor of democratic market socialism. For example, the later John Stuart Mill, the Yugoslav praxis philosophers and economists, such as Mihailo Markovic, Svetozar Stojanovic, and Branko Horvat, and other philosophers and economists, such as perhaps Noverto Vovio in Italy, Jaroslav Vanek, who I believe was originally from Hungary, but has been in the United States for a long time, John Romer, and David Schweiker, who I previously mentioned as analytical Marxist. Um, for the fourth tradition <coughs> is, you can call it democratic, non-market, but non-Marxist socialism. For example, the Fabian socialists from the early 20th century in Great Britain, like uh, the Webb, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, and so on. And also contemporary advocates of a participatory economy, or which is sometimes abbreviated as paracon, such as Noam Chomsky and Michael Albert and Robin Hanel. The fifth noble political tradition I'm talking about is are non-Stalinist forms of Marxism and revolutionary socialism. For example, classical Marxists and slash revolutionary socialists such as Marx, Engels, Eugene V. Debs in the United States, Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, and Gramsci, as well as third world revolutionary socialist leaders like Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, and Hugo Chavez. Also, Marxist humanists like Raya Dunayevskaya, I don't know how to say that exactly, Dunayevskaya, and Adam Schaff, who was a Polish philosopher, and Erich Fromm, it's a very famous German critical theorist, uh, psychologist, sociologist, and philosopher, and also new, what you might call new left uh, Marxists because they uh, edited and, and published a lot of articles in the New Left Review, um, such as E.P. Thompson, although he's a, a older member of the Communist Party in Great Britain, Roy Medvedev, the famous Russian uh, Marxist dissident, Ralph Miliband, and Perry Anderson. And finally, analytical Marxists, who I've mentioned uh, previously, such as, well, I say formerly G.A. Cohen, that's a little complicated because G.A. Cohen was sort of the first really famous analytical Marxist, but after the fall of the Soviet Union and the dissolution of the Soviet bloc, he claimed he was no longer a Marxist, even though he said he was still a socialist. Um, the fall of the Soviet Union didn't make much difference to myself, for example, and most of these other theoreticians, because I think that we never um, considered the Soviet Union and, and similar societies as genuine forms of socialism to begin with. So when they fell, we you know, didn't have our um, uh, uh, views about socialism and Marxism shaken by that. Okay, But Cohen apparently did, because he was uh, raised from a very young age um, as a, in a communist uh, uh, family. And um, among analytical Marxists, besides G.A. Cohen, there's Jan Elster, John Romer, and Eric Owen Wright. And finally, my good friends, socialist anarchists, such as Nikolai Bakunin, Peter Kropotkin, Emma Goldman, and more recently, Noam Chomsky, who are almost always opposed to market socialism. But what I want to point out at this point <clears throat> is that although this so-called official Marxism and communism was by far the largest and most influential version of Marxism and the socialist or communist movement in the world from the 1917 Russian Revolution until this collapse of communism in Europe from 1989 to 91, it is far from the only version of Marxism during these decades or now. <clears throat> 
Even if we limit ourselves to revolutionary socialism, there have been many other versions of Marxism since at least the late 1920s. <coughs> First, historically speaking, developed the Marxism of the left opposition, which included not only the followers of Leon Trotsky, but also many of the followers of Rosa Luxemburg, which, while always supportive of the USSR as what they called a degenerated worker state, and of the Eastern European communist countries after World War II as what they called deformed worker states, in terms of any conflict, well, they, they supported those kind of societies in, in any conflict with the capitalist powers of the West, whether armed uh, conflict or even ideological um, conflict, as far as the basic progressive nature of these societies, socialist property relations was concerned. Okay, That was uh, the view of the remnants of the left opposition that they, they uh, um, th thought that uh, the um, societies, uh, so-called communist countries, should be defended against capitalist attacks, but at the same time, they were highly critical of those societies. <clears throat> uh, this Marxist tendency was implacably critical of Stalinism, and more genuinely, um, or generally, a lack of genuine workers' democracy, both within the communist parties and in these societies as a whole, and consistently called for political revolutions against the ossified, repressive, overly privileged bureaucracies in the USSR and later existing communist countries, uh, while they called for the preservation of socialist property relations. At the same time, they called for and worked towards socialist revolutions in capitalist countries, which would both change fundamental property relations from capitalist to socialist, and at the same time establish a genuine workers' democracy. It is at least arguable that this Marxist tendency has been and is the most faithful to the theories, views, and values of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, despite its uh, physical extinction in the USSR, I mean the physical extinction of the left opposition, under Stalin in the late 1920s and 30s, and its vilification by the official communist parties around the world as being social fascist or socialist fascists, and its consistent harassment by capitalist governments and right-wing forces, as well as by the official communist parties, which included the GPU organized or, or, or ordered assassinations of such leading figures as Leon Trotsky and almost all members of his family. <clears throat> in fact, in my book, Marxism, Morality, and Social Justice, I define classical Marxism, for my purposes, as consisting of the theories, views, and values of these three Marxists, that is Marx, Lenin, uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, plus Luxembourg, Trotsky, and Antonio Gramsci. Although certainly Gramsci took a significantly different theoretical path by so strongly emphasizing the cultural factors that must be taken into consideration in any society, together with social, economic, and political factors, and the polemical and ideological factors that must be taken into consideration in any struggle for socialism. I would also have no problem uh, including uh, such figures as Karl Kotsky on this list of what I call classical Marxists. <clears throat> Okay, but the question, or an obvious question is, uh, why today would anyone support some kind of socialism, even if they describe it as democratic socialism or democratic market socialism, as opposed to capitalism? Um, one of the articles, essays I've, I've written uh, uh, is called Critique of the Official Story concerning contemporary economies, capitalism, and markets. I won't have time to read the whole thing, but I'd like to read um, the claims that are made um, in favor of this official story, and then uh, very briefly uh, explain what my response is to them. So the first claim, I think there's about seven or eight of them that I've analyzed here, 
The first claim is that capitalism has triumphed over socialism and communism and will never be replaced by any other economic system, at least in the foreseeable future, because it is more efficient than its only known competitor, socialist economic systems, and is more compatible with freedom and democracy, which people greatly desire. These claims, famously trumpeted by Francis Fukuyama in his 1993 work The End of History and the Last Man, and others, after the collapse of the USSR and the Soviet bloc, is an incredibly incautious claim, to say the least. I think I will read this section, actually. Although there is fairly strong prima facie evidence or, or, or a case for these claims, given presently existing historical evidence, these comparisons between capitalist and socialist economies primarily work against command economy socialist economies and societies, rather than market socialist economies and societies. Moreover, measuring economic efficiency is, to some extent, problematic because there are various definitions of economic efficiency. For example, although market economies seem to be more efficient than command economies at catering to consumer demands in a consumer-oriented economy due to the lack of feedback mechanisms in command economies, if we ask which kind of economic system is most efficient at rapidly building up a low-level, underdeveloped economy, the evidence is heavily on the side of command economies. For example, the economic growth and development of the USSR from the end of the destructive four-year civil war there in 1921 until the outbreak of World War II on the Eastern Front, well, the invasion of uh, when Nazi Germany invaded the USSR, which was in 1940 or 41, I can't remember the exact year, um, is virtually unprecedented in world history, the amount of growth in that 20 year period. In this case, the USSR went from an extremely low level of economic development and production to an extremely high level of economic development and production in only 18 or 19 years. In only 18 or 19 years, they became economically powerful enough that they could resist and eventually defeat Nazi Germany on the Eastern Front where about 60% of the fighting took place in the European theater of operations in World War II, and where about 90% of the casualties occurred, primarily civilian casualties. What makes this economic growth and development even more astounding is the fact that the USSR had virtually no investment capital come into its economy from the outside since all of the capitalist nations were trying their best to prevent the USSR from growing into a large-scale economic, military, and political power. Compare this, for example, to the rapid growth of Germany, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Israel in the first two or three decades after World War II. All of these countries had massive amounts of foreign capital flow into their economies during these decades, and no one claims that they could have grown at the rates they did if such massive flows of foreign capital hadn't flowed into their capitalist economies. Another amazing historical example of such incredibly rapid economic growth and development is that which the People's Republic of China has experienced from around 1980 until now. From the Chinese Revolution that culminated in 1948 until around 1980, or 1978 or 80, the People's, the PCR, uh, had a command economy, People's Republic, PRC, People's Republic of China, had a command economy more or less along the line of the Soviet model, though perhaps with more emphasis on the countryside and less emphasis on the development of heavy industry. But during the current period of economic growth from around 1980 until now, China has averaged around 8 to 10 percent economic growth per year. However, this is not really evidence for the economic uh, efficiency of command economies in promoting rapid growth of relatively underdeveloped economies since this growth has taken place in the context of significant privatization and marketization of its economy, which arguably has made it best described as what I call an intermediate economy, rather than either a capitalist or market socialist economy. In China, they officially call it uh, Chinese 
market socialism or market socialism with Chinese characteristics, in my analysis, there are uh, definite still socialist aspects of the economy. Most of the uh, capital is still controlled by the, the government, the public sector, uh, but there are definite uh, uh, capitalist aspects of the economy. Uh, so I think it's sort of right now hovering between capitalism and market socialism and might go either way in the future. And I believe as uh, uh, Lubos said, uh, noted, I've been trying my best over the last five years or so since I've been going to China a lot to push them toward the market socialist path as best I can. Anyway, and, and other people have been doing that too, including uh, David Schweikert and others. Um, nevertheless, it seems that public or government ownership and control of the largest economic enterprises and the most important or basic parts of the economy, such as banking, insurance, telecommunications, energy production and distribution, mining, steel, and the defense industries has been the key to China's ability to continue to grow even when the rest of the world has experienced recession such as the one begun in the United States in the fall of 2008. Uh, undoubtedly, there are other factors involved, such as China's regulation of its currency and its refusal to let the yuan float in relation to other currencies, but it seems that there can be little doubt that the Chinese government's ownership and control of the bulk of investment wealth in these central parts of their economy is a major factor in its ability to not be very much affected by recessions in other parts of the world economy. But why should this be the case? Why should government or public ownership and control of the bulk of investment wealth of an economy be such an advantage in this respect? As, I've, as I have pointed out elsewhere, a major feature of capitalist economies that make stock market panics possible, which in turn lead to recessions and can even lead to de depressions, is the anarchic nature of capital investment in such societies. In capitalist economies, stock markets represent the sales-oriented, money-circulating part of the economy, as opposed to the basic infrastructure part of an economy, like roads, highways, bridges, dams, dikes, and so on that the government usually owns and operates, that is the basic superstructure or basic uh, infrastructure, and which is not sales oriented or money circulating uh, uh, you know, in terms of the being part of the market uh, in nature. In all capitalist societies, there are many large-scale private investors, individuals, families, partnerships, corporations, money market managers, hedge fund managers, retirement account firms, and so on who put their capital in and take their capital out of the stock markets according to where they expect to make the highest profits, that is, receive the highest returns on their investment capital. These decisions depend on their particular estimations of how much profit they will make by putting their capital into the stock market, into that part of the economy, which is the productive part of the economy, or leaving it there if it's already there as opposed to taking the capital out and putting it in government bonds or simply parking it, as I say, someplace they consider safe during economically pessimistic times, especially during stock market panics. During, stock, during such stock market panics, more and more investors decide to get out of the stock market before stocks go even lower, which leads to a snowball effect and thus to even more money flowing out of the stock market, that market-oriented productive sector of the economy. And although these panics are usually associated with some objective features of an economy, such as the expectation by some large investors that an economic bubble is about to burst, that is, that overvalued assets are about to undergo a significant what they say, market correction, to bring them more in line with their real value. In reality, no such negative economic features of an economy need be present for a stock market panic to take place. All that is required is that some large investors take significant capital out of the stock markets and that other major investors notice this and follow suit 
do the same, such that the snowball effect begins. Arguably, what prevents, well, let, let me make uh, one explanatory comment here. Um, every in, uh, investor of large capital in, in a capitalist system, right, they are all, nobody is acting irrationally during a stock market panic. Every one of those investors is acting completely rationally, okay, because if they think the stock market is going to continue to go down, excuse me, um, they are rational to take their money out now where they can cash their stocks in for this value before it goes way down, you know, further and they'll lose money, right? So they can take, it's better, more rational for each of them to take their money out now if they think the stock market is going to continue to go down and park it in some other place like in government bonds or wherever. Um, government during the uh, recession, 2008 recession in the United States, the U.S. Treasury was getting so many billions and billions of dollars flowing into to buy its bonds, it kept lowering the, the interest rate that was paid on its bonds. It got down to zero, zero interest rates. And even after the interest rates on U.S. government bonds were set at zero percent, they still had hundreds of billions of dollars come in to the bond, the bond market, right? Because that was just a safe place. Not only are they preventing themselves from losing money in the stock market, I mean losing, say, more money, but they think, oh, if I take it out now, my investment capital, hundreds of millions or billions, however many dollars it is, then when the stock market goes way down, and I think it's more or less reached the bottom, then I can take the money I have, you know, out of the bonds account, and then I can buy even more stocks since the stocks are lower in price, and then when the stocks go back up, I'll have even more money, right? So every single investor is operating completely rationally in terms of their expected self-interest, right? But even though every single investor in this capital system is operating completely rationally from their own individual point of view, the whole system is irrational. Because the whole there's no economic system, I mean, a system that allows this to occur in an economy to crash, basically, in a huge recession or depression is irrational, structurally speaking. Right? So you have perfect rationality of individual investors, but the structure of the economy, of the capitalist economy, is irrational. Right? So, um, okay. Now, arguably, what prevents such uh, stock market panics and associated recessions or conceivably even depressions in the Chinese economic model, it, for example, is that enough of the investment capital is in the hands of the public sector, the state in this instance, such that it simply is not possible for truly massive amounts of capital to flow out of the productive part of the economy, in, you know, the market part of the economy, since no sane government is going to intentionally and abruptly withdraw massive amounts of capital from any sector of its economy, knowing that this will create a major recession or depression. This is a lesson that should be absorbed by other countries, and this is also a major argument for going to or maintaining this kind of public ownership and control of at least the bulk of economic enterprises and investment capital in at least the centrally most important parts of an economy. Um, the next um, uh, claim of the official story of how capitalism is wonderful and great and, and, and virtually perfect and socialism is, is, is terrible and undesirable is that capitalism is more efficient than socialist economic systems because it has relatively free markets which not only spark technological innovation and creative entrepreneurship, but also motivates capital investment and by, by the market's invisible hand, make sure that productive resources are distributed and utilized in an efficient way, tending toward fulfillment of what economists call Pareto optimality, optimality criterion of economic efficiency. And socialist economies have none of these advantages, it's claimed. Um, 
Okay. Uh, well, I guess that's important enough. I should read that section very quickly. Um, first, it is not so clear that capitalism is significantly better at spurring technological innovation than socialist economies, even command socialist economies. After all, in the areas of pure and applied sciences, including military and aerospace technologies, the command socialist economy of the USSR was pretty much able to keep up with the US and the West during the Cold War. However, when it comes to catering to consumer demands, it does seem that market economies are better able than command economies to spur creative entrepreneurship concerning consumer products. But this argument doesn't favor capitalist economies over market socialist economies, which can be arranged in such a way to make possible and reward such creative entrepreneurship. Second, Lee, command economies as well as market socialist economies have their own mechanisms for generating and directing capital investments which do not rely on the savings of capitalists or their willingness to invest these savings, investment capital. I shall say more about this below. Third, to the extent that the market's invisible hand does make sure that the productive resources are distributed and utilized in an efficient way toward, um, in an efficient way, tending toward Pareto optimality. Um, this does not favor capitalist economies over market socialist economies, although it does favor both of these kinds of market economies over command economies. Okay, I'm just going to uh, read what the rest of the claims are, uh, and then um, uh, uh, we'll be quitting pretty soon here and have discussions. So another claim, the third one made, that I'm criticizing on the nature of capital and capitalists is that fundamental inputs into economic production in all modern mass societies are land, that is natural resources, capital, and labor. And of course, that's perfectly true if you define those terms correctly. Um, but if you define them correctly, capital doesn't refer to paper capital. Capital refers to physical capital, like the build up infrastructure of society. So um, this is probably connected. Yeah, this is connected with the next um, claim that's often made in favor of capitalism. Capital comes from capitalists, so obviously, capitalists are essential to any modern economic system. For without capitalists, there would be no capital invested or injected into an economy, and thus the economy would grind to a halt. Well, that's true for capitalist systems, right? Because the capital comes from capitalists and capitalist systems, but that's not true of any modern system, right? I mean, the USSR obviously had physical capital, growth of its physical capital, investment of, you know, capital and so on, without having capitalists per se. So, you know, this is a, a absurd uh, view, but it's one that's very widespread in the West. Um, another claim um, that I critique is that capitalists are also necessary in any modern market economy because they provide the entrepreneurial functions of bringing together natural resources, capital, and labor for the purposes of the production and distribution of goods and services in the market sector of the economy. Well, what I say about that is um, uh, that capitalists and entrepreneurs do overlap, those categories overlap in uh, capitalist societies, but they're not the same. There are lots of capitalists who never are, are not entrepreneurs and never did anything in their entire life except sign some papers, and there are entrepreneurs that are capitalists because they didn't make enough of a fortune to be considered capitalist. And finally, most importantly, if you have a market social society, you can very easily have entrepreneurs within a market social, within the context of a market social society. Uh, another claim I criticize is on getting capital invested in a modern economy or motivating capitalists to invest, you have to, uh, you know, uh, keep, uh, 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 you know, uh, labor costs low, you know, you have to uh, give them subsidies, maybe you have to uh, entice them to do that. And that's true in capitalist economies, but it doesn't need to be true in all modern economies, like a, a, a market socialist economy. And another uh, claim I criticize is 
uh, in the current age of globalization and neoliberal policies, a government must keep business taxes and income taxes low so that businesses will not move their facilities and operations to other countries or other parts of the same country where taxes and labor costs are lower. And that is true of capitalist economies as I'm sure you all know in Slovakia, it would not be true in a market socialist economy. Also a claim free markets result in greater economic efficiency on the international level, just as on the national level, and thus greater GDPs, gross domestic products for any country that participates in the neoliberal world economic system by joining the World Trade Organization and so on. Moreover, since a rising, they used to, or still say, neoliberals, a rising tide raises all boats, great and small. They claim that everyone in the world, or virtually everyone uh, in any country that submits itself to neoliberal policies would be economically better off, even the poorest people. And of course the evidence after 30 years of these policies is that the rich people got richer and maybe the middle class expanded somewhat in some countries, but the poor parts of the population, generally speaking, are more poor than they were before the neoliberal uh, policies were um, uh, 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 accepted. Anyway, I, I have a lot more I could say, but I believe my time is up, so I'll just uh, stop now and uh, uh, welcome any questions, comments, or discussions. So thank you very much.